I am Julie Moody Freeman. I'm the director of the Center for Black Diaspora at DePaul University. This event is co-sponsored by our center and by the Chicago Artists Coalition. I would like to acknowledge a few people before we get started and then introduce you to our artists today. Um, I would like to thank all who have made this First and foremost, Jewel Daly. She is the assistant director of the center who organized this event and curated the artists at the Chicago Artists Coalition. Thanks to our staff, Jessica Williams and Jennifer Ogumiki. I'll introduce our panelists for tonight's event and then I'll pass you over to Teresa Silva, who will then talk about the Chicago Artists Coalition. But before I do that, let me introduce in alphabetical order our panelists today. I will start with Katie Chung. Hi, Katie. Hi. Katie is a Korean American visual artist from Chicago working in drawing, print, and sculpture. She blends her heritage and personal identity to build a legacy that reveals her relationship to immigration and labor. She received her BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, participated in local and international exhibitions, and is currently a member of Candor Arts, a resource for the design and production of artist books. Thanks for being here, Katie. Thank you. Richard Dingo Dingwall. Okay. This evening, I believe all the way from Jamaica. He started writing in 1994, joining the Poetry Society of Jamaica in 1995. He recorded the CD Ransom in 2000, a unique blend of music and poetry. He was a featured poet on the Calabash Literary Festival in 2002, featured on the Word Alive Literary Festival in St. Lucia 2013, he performed on the Jamaica Rising event in Bristol, UK to honor Jamaica's poet laureate, Professor Mervyn Morris in 2014. He has now published his first collection of poetry titled A Window to Let the Light Out. His poetry has also been published in a number of anthologies, including the Culture's Sud Anthology, So Much Things to Say, the Calabash Literary Festivals Anthology, and Jubilation, poems celebrating 50 years of Jamaican independence. Richard is currently working on a screenplay and his second collection of poet, poetry. Thanks for being here. Unimi Abasa Udo works across various media, including textiles, prints, artists' books, and computer games in an attempt to bring to light and make peace with an idea of the void. Their practice centers on surface and absence, text as image, redaction, redundancy, and blackness as color and construct. Udo holds an MFA in visual communication design from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in architecture from Columbia University. The moderator for tonight is Jewel Daly, who I've talked about before, who organ organized this. Jewel is an independent curator, filmmaker, photographer, and cultural producer. Jewel holds a BA in urban studies, uh, in urban studies and East Asian studies from Rutgers University a master's in urban planning at IFU Institute Francois de Urban Urbanisme at the University of Paris. She is currently an MFA candidate in film production directing at DePaul School of Cinema Arts. She is co-founder of Saloon Cajou and produces itinerant art pop-up exhibitions that showcases emerging Chicago artists. Is currently the Hatch Curatorial Resident at the Chicago Artists Coalition and an Advisory Council member at High Concept Labs. I'd like to thank all of you for agreeing to participate on this panel. 
very excited about it. And thanks to the Chicago Artists Coalition for collaborating with the Center for Black Diaspora. I'd like to pass you on now to Teresa Silva. Thank you so much, Joelle, and cheers to you and Uno and Katie on your fantastic exhibition, um, which was put on pause because of COVID, but has now reopened this month. And I'm so excited by the number of people who have made appointments to come through the space. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself to the group who don't know me. I'm Teresa Silva, the executive and artistic director at the Chicago Artists Coalition. Um, and we support emerging and established artists through many different programs that we do through two residency programs. One is Bolt, one is Hatch. Uh, we do that through four artist grant opportunities, um, unrestricted funds for artists to support directly their creative practice or life related needs. And we also have an online resources page um, for artists across the city to use um, that is free for job and exhibition opportunities and also for locating studio spaces. Um, so Hatch residency of which Uno and Katie and Joel are a part of is very unique. It's a dual residency program where artists and curators uh, collaborate to conceptualize and to realize exhibitions and programming, such as tonight's talk. Um, it's very you know, experimental and it's something though that has been thriving for 10 years now, um, this program. And through the 10 years, we've been able to support about 37 curators in Chicago um, and also 190 artists. So it's a vast network um, in each session but also within the 10 years that we've been doing this. And I'm very proud about this program because more so than any other program that CAC does, I see the most collaboration that happens and also those relationships thriving once the program is over, which is about a year and a half. So yeah, so just wanted to talk a little bit about that to understand the context of how Joel, Uno and Katie came together to put together this marvelous show. So. I, would, I will turn it back over to Joelle. First of all, I want to um, extend, uh, an, extend a deep thanks to uh, Chicago Artists Coalition and of course the Center for Black Diaspora for co-hosting this event um, around the current show, Excavating Memories. Um, Excavating Memory, which is now on view until January 21st by appointment. Excavating Memory um, is a, a show which is about the journey into the world of archiving and memorializing um, and reclaiming cultural erasure um, using photography, drawing, sculptural objects and mixed media installations. And when uh, I met both um, Uno and Katie, uh, and working together before the show got installed, we sort of talked about what is the show going to be about. And one of the things that, you know, and think today's show is the, um, the last of three virtual events that we've had around the show. And I felt like today's show should have been entitled Past Tense, um, as it refers to uh, the actual name of the show, which is Excavating Memory. And that's pretty much what the, for people who haven't seen the show, there are images which I'll share later on so you can have a context of what it is about. I wanted to start off um, by asking, I didn't want this to be a really sort of formal academic talk. I wanted it to be sort of um, really sort of free and laid back, but I did have some structure to it. And I wanted to make sure folks who haven't seen the show can actually see some of the pieces that we're talking about. And so the first uh, slide is of, let me, what's going on? Wait a minute, let's go back. The first, oops. The first uh, set of images that I have up there, Uno's work is on the left um, and I've added uh, a couple other photographs on the right, which sort of um, echoes some of the themes that I believe Uno is discussing in her work. The, the bottom one is a well-known American anthropologist who, 
whose name I have very difficulty pronouncing, but I'll share with you shortly, um, who basically went around sort of documenting Native Americans um, and trying to keep sort of an archive of the different song that they sang. So she went to Minnesota and she did that. There's another, um, the Museum of Central African Art um, in Belgium has the top image on the right where you have a collection or collecting art objects um, that you see here. And so my first question goes for Uno, your, the photographic elements that everyone is looking here on the left, on my left, um, has elements in the show that interrogate the idea of official history as it relates to African people and objects. What is it about this topic of remembering and how others are remembered and others that means others in quotation um, that you find problematic? What does it mean for you that some is histories remain unseen or not visible? Uh, thank you, Joel. Um, I think I should also just um, clarify a bit on my end of the screen what um, you all are looking at. So for as a body of work, um, there are actually six of them in the show. I think Joel has them on another slide as well. Um, I created the assemblages. They're actually, they're mirrored in person. But in them, uh, you have a, a caption that's actually taken from the accessibility text of a photo of colonial Nigeria, which is where uh, my family is from, Nigeria, not, well, I guess, no, from colonial Nigeria. They were from the, <laughs> the OG colony, um, pre-independence. Um, and um, so there's a photo, there's a caption from the accessibility text from the British Museum's photos that were taken um, before independence um, in 19, 1960. And in the background behind the sheet of mirror mylar, which like creates this, um, the mirrored effect you can see in the upper photo are series of photographs taken here in the US by um, my younger brother who was born here as I was. And so um, in this work, and I think generally something that um, really strikes me about this, like this history, I guess my family's personal history, but also the history of um, the area that would become Nigeria is a sense of distance. Um, and a sense of loss. And so the a sense of separation um, between myself and myself in this country and myself and this history and the separation that is mediated in large part by museums. And, um, you know, as I think we all know, the museum narrative isn't necessarily like a neutral or um, accurate one. And so that um, trying to understand how others understand you and like how that, how that like understanding or misunderstanding um, came to be is something that um, I'm really interested in, interested in overall in like, not um, not only in the specific narrative, but overall um, ideas of communication, um, miscommunication, and the building of narratives. And so investigating, um, investigating those and finding uh, where they don't really line up and kind of drives a lot of my work. Um, does that answer the question? I know it sort of like went a full circle. <laughs> well, you did answer the question. I, I was just, 
I was just curious because when I first encountered your work, I felt like I was very intrigued by the fact that um, you would put different text on images as almost to contrast the official type imagery that we see, like the ones we see on my other side of the screen in terms of what is official and what is uh, the real narrative. And I was just curious to know what made you decide that you're interested in, there was one photo where it says group photo of four young females and we don't see anybody. And what, what was the impulse to do that? Are you kind of poking fun at a photo that we'd have seen probably in the 1800s of sort of like a, an image of ethnographic photographs of natives by a lake or by a river or what was the impulse to work with the text on the work? Well, I, I work with text in a lot of my work. I'd say almost most of it. Um, I'm trained as a graphic designer and really invested in typography and like text. Um, text as a medium, especially text and how the the form and presentation of text affects its meaning. And so for these, um, my motivations, I guess, were many, but on the one hand, I wanted to show these sort of two, um, the two poles of this experience, of sort of the experience that I'm trying to grapple with here. One, the experience of um, my and my primary um, interaction with Nigeria, especially with Nigeria of this time period, being through museums and um, like their official narrative, and then um, my or actually to be more um, technically correct, my brother's experience. Uh, I sort of use him as a stand-in in a lot of um, recent work. Uh, which is, you know, growing up in America and um, in like really in a landscape that's very different than what's depicted in any of these um, photos in the museum and sort of um, showing these like idyllic landscapes, like idyllic American landscapes contrasted with these captions, which are also like in some cases actually quite violent. And part of, um, so there's separation in that sense. And then I also just wanted to make um, all of, make sure that all of the photos that do appear are, as you say, like empty of um, human, um, of, like, human figures. There is some evidence of human presence in one through the trash can. Um, but part of that came from that as I was going through the British Museum's um, digital archives, like a lot of the photos, these ethnographic photos, um, the question of like the consent of the people being photographed is really unclear. And some of these images, um, it doesn't, like people don't seem like they want um, want to be photographed. And I think about that a lot in the context of, um, of museums and the objects that appear in museums, particularly um, this comes up with a lot of African, um, African art objects, artifacts, um, documentation, um, but also it goes for um, works in many museum galleries that, from around the world that sort of get subsumed into ethnographic collections, but you see like, you know, the issues like mummies, um, the ethics of displaying like, people's bodies who, you know, certainly did not want that given that they went <laughs> to great lengths to make their bodies hard to find. Um, again, photos of people who um, might not have had the ability to consent to being photographed um, because they're being photographed by somebody with institutional power over them. Um, and then again, for long dead and 
could not have said that they wanted their photos to appear in the museum. So that um, in a really long nutshell <laughs> is why the photos are, or the captions are not, um, are separated from the photos and why the photos that appear are so empty. Right, right. Thank you for that. I wanted to sort of pivot over to Katie, um, whose work um, uh, is really, really interesting. And the I, for people who haven't seen the show, these are these are some elements of uh, Katie's piece in the show. And the question I have for Katie is the theme. The, any, the theme of reverence for the past is very evident in your work and particularly in the piece with your family members in front of a, a family member in front of a memorial structure in Korea. Uh, the work among others in the show is imbued with familial sacrifice about grit and hard work. Is this an accurate observation and what prompted you to formalize this in pieces you've created? Um, well, thank you. Um, I guess, where do I start? That is a very accurate uh, reference or er, um, observation of my work, but I would also phrase it as like this process of healing. Um, like for example, this scissor in a box is just a plain pair of scissors, but throughout the process of making, I'm creating, you know, I'm elevating this ordinary object and creating a perspective where I'm allowed to, or at least able to see like the highlights of all the aging, of all the like yards it's cut, all of the just different dents that happen in the metal and see it as something special rather than, you know, just an old pair of scissors I'm used to seeing around in the shop. Um, so this whole body of work has really been about appreciate, like learning how to appreciate where I come from. And how does this how does this relate to your own lineage um you talked and i know in past you talked about your fa your family's dry cleaners business how does this how do you relate to this lineage i relate to this lineage sometimes i don't relate to this lineage and that's where this where it comes from there's a distance you know especially with being the first generation american or korean american here so sometimes i feel like I'm not Korean enough. So having this practice explore this side of my family and my culture allows me to feel closer um, and also just learn more. Um, I was not keen on learning about these things when I was younger. It's, it's not into the idea of being different. So um, does that answer the question? <laughs> It does answer the question, but it also goes back to this notion of memory too. The use of putting a family member as a part of this ensemble. Um, what are you trying to remember here? I'm trying to remember, I think this is something I remind myself every day is how lucky I am. I think about my family members, particularly the women in my family and how even one generation before me had such limited lives. So I feel like the lucky one with the freedom that's allowed to have the education, the resources, and the freedom to be able to preserve the culture and the family that I've come from. Um, so I'm just trying to take advantage of that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Katie. I was gonna invite Dingo in uh, right now before moving moving forward, just so that um, he has quite a few things to say and to share. I have a lot to say. <laughs> uh, should I start with the piece or should I? Whatever, however you feel comfortable. If you want to make a comment before you say the piece, that's fine as well. Uh, you mean comment on my piece or on my fellow artists? Your fellow artists. Uh, I think one of the things I wanted to ask uh, Uno is, uh, about this, you know, her her definition of uh, museum colonialism uh, and this idea of uh, art as evidence. Can she hear me? 
Hello. Yeah. Yes. Richard? Yes. Yes. No. I. No. I can hear you. Richard. Um, and one more thing. I just wanted to oh, correct. Right. You. I remember. I remember. <laughs> um. Yeah. I guess what um I was what um particularly about museum colonialism. No, I I I had never heard the term before today. Oh. Yeah. So I guess I mean it's been getting. I mean, it's been a thing for, you know, ever, but it's um, mm. been getting a lot more airtime recently. Um, right. So I think it's, um, it's meaning they're kind of uh, multiple, but the way I uh, sort of think of it, simplify it, um, is that, so most, um, Western museums, um, especially like the sort of encyclopedic museums, like the British Museum, the Met, um, the Art Institute of Chicago, they acquired a large part of their sort of non-Western, non-European collections through the um, process of colonial extraction. So like when um, so it's some of actually some of these pieces deal with like when the British um, sacked Benin, they looted like thousands of um, ritual like ritual objects, um, memorial bronze heads, which are now some of the most I mean some of the most famous like African artworks, um, but were all looted in an act of war, um, taken to Europe where they were sold, you know, generating fortunes for the people who stole them and then um, are now in museums. So there's the colonial acquisition of um, these objects and how these objects were used to build like co colonial wealth. And now as they remain in museums, um, they also um, reinforce the uh, colonial narrative of the places um, where they were taken from. And so like in the case of the African objects, it's essentially like, oh, Africa, um, a place without, like a place without time, a place without history. Um, we, get, we have all of these things that are now um, in Europe, but, and when asked, them, when asked to return them, European museums up until very recently have said, oh, well, you know, Africa is like kind of backwards. They don't know how to take care of these things, but we can take care of their things. And so the, like the paternal, um, paternalistic attitude um, that is um, perpetuated by keeping these objects. And then also if you, read a lot of the um, so like the captions, the wall text for um, these um, objects in museums, they're often like incredibly like infantilizing and othering um, a common site entering in um, a gallery in a museum like for the African galleries is a map of Africa, which is something I've never seen in the European paintings gallery, even though I don't remember where Lichtenstein is. Um, and texts that will say things like, oh, you know, in, um, in Burkina Faso, women weave cloth for such things as clothing, which reinforce again, this sort of Africa, how strange, but if you read even beneath not even, you don't even really need to go beneath the surface to see that um, they're really going out of their way um, to perpetuate this like myth of the dark continent and like these strange people who do strange things like make clothes out of cloth. Yeah, <laughs> did that answer? Oh, for sure. <laughs> okay, Richard, I'll let you go. Um, Richard has created a, a poem in reaction to the works of both the artists in the show. So you have the floor. 
Uh, well, I don't know if it's specifically created uh, in response to it, um, but I would say uh, the idea of loss in, uh, in Uno's work, uh, I, I have a poem called uh, Autocorrect. And, it, you know, it, it stemmed from the frustrating experience of having, um, of trying to type in Patois. Um, and I don't know how familiar everybody is with the Jamaican Patois. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a very frustrating experience to have that corrected to English when you're trying to. Um, <laughs> when you're trying to relate to somebody. Uh, and so I wrote this piece um, and it stemmed from her idea of loss, like the link to her work, uh, to their work, I'm sorry, is from the, this idea of loss uh, and how, and the arrogance of, of uh, the way you speak with this kind of a hybrid tongue, um, subject to your colonial history, um, and then having, having to have that corrected. And also it, 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 surpassed, it surpassed the idea of it being on, on a phone to how you're viewed in Jamaica if you speak in Patois. Um, and just the respect for the language. You can find all these debates online about what is dialect and what is language and so on. Um, I just call it my native tongue. And so this is autocorrect. I don't speak like you, yet I'm unable to speak like then. This commingled tongue with no voice echoes the silence on unspeakables. The skin will dilute, the heart forgive, it needs to, the tongue will hold what it knows. Each word a painting, a marker, like a creased page. The perceived rudimentary complexion of this grafted tongue is its own crier, demanding redress while painting silver linings on estate windows, though reflection is not your thing. The rawness you hear, the serrated grit, is the unsaid, unswallowed, left stagnant in the mouth till a tongue grows teeth. This tone, deeper than marrow, than memory, even steeped in learning drips crudely in foreign tongue. It's hard for cover like the boiling saltfish. These echoes of Igbo and a can now fly through air like Bushman arrow tipped in the white milk, yet my voice don't slow your heart. These words, a failing rope bridge, scorned and forsaken even by its own crosses, womb cursing intelligentsia embellished in laurel wreaths to lost irony, they clap like nobility to the festivals of, colonial, of colloquial carnage, trading their antiquities for naught like mango vendors at late evening. I'm on no speak, I'm on soundtrack, I'm on soundtrack to view, soundtrack to view master or the flicking page as images move, images move, images seem to move, images stay the same. All I was trying to do was write a few words in my own language with my own sensibilities. Maybe not so much writing as grouting the white space with the one thing we left with these words. So it is with them my history. In rewrite, it auto corrects. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that, Richard. I really enjoyed listening to it. And there's some sort of connection between the idea of official history and official memory, mm -hmm. uh, an official language. Because when people think of, uh, you know, what is the official language of a particular country? Um, I like how you're playing with the idea of patwa being the non-official language and right. the impulse to always try to autocorrect and speak proper English. Um, how do you think that is connected to other elements of um, 
the discussion that we've been having, because I feel like there's so many connections, because Katie also used language, and we'll get to that later. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it, it is the idea, like I said, of uh, the arrogance of, of what could be considered loss. Like, if in the beginning of the poem, I say, I can't speak like then. Uh, so there's a reason why I don't speak um, any other language except the one I speak now. Um, and that is because of slavery. Um, so the idea that it is not to be celebrated um, in Jamaica, for example, like I say, where um, you will be looked down upon. In a, in, a, in a given day, I would say I use patwa. And the poem is tongue in cheek as well, because the poem is about patwa, but the poem itself is mostly in English. Um, but on a given day, I would say I speak 80% patwa and 20% English. Um, so don't get it twisted. Like I will, I know how to emphasize my H is has his necessary. You know? So um, the the idea of um, yeah of that loss is 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 what I thought the main tie was. Does Katie or Uno have any response to that in terms of his reaction to particularly Uno about official and non-official? I was going to say, uh, Katie, go. I feel like I've talked a ton. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say I I, I like what um, Richard said about how people get angry, but were you talking about angry talking in patois or angry and talking about talking in English? Like which which language gets which response? Right. So if you, it's not so much anger. It's 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 your it's your your perceived um, the perception of you um, just based on how you speak. Um, I suppose not unlike a Black American speaking uh, Ebonics, um, but it is this idea that it is less than. Mm. Okay. Um, so I championed the idea. So it's actually the very first. Um, it's 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 a topic that I feel strongly about. You know. Well, I'm hoping they uh, get an autocorrect that's a little bit more inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Even just trying to type a name on there is like, what's the point? <laughs> and also speaking about, uh, talk about text and language, I just wanted to pivot to another piece of work in the show done by Uno and where, where Uno uses text um, in the work and I'll share my screen just so you can see that. Let's share my screen. Bear with me for a second. So Uno, I wanted to just, you know, from what Richard said about language and text, um, I wanted to sort of talk to you about what was the reason, you know, what is what is the relationship to past tense, which is what some of the, the work we talked about early refers to, and the present tense where you sort of use this text here to make references to your brother. Yeah, so this piece, um, it's actually the sort of physical, um, I think this isn't quite the piece per se, but the piece is a, an interactive HTML uh, game, which is pretty hard to show over Zoom. Um, then, but if anyone uh, has time after the show, I actually have a link up to it, um, you can play it on my website since um, you also probably shouldn't be touching screens in the gallery, <laughs> shared screens in the gallery if you make it to CAC. Um, so as I was um, making the previous, the other body of work um, with the photographs, I had been thinking, um, so like I said, those photos are actually photos that my younger brother um, took uh, sort of across the US over the past several years. And even before that, I had been thinking a lot about those um, bronze 
uh, bronze heads from the Benin Kingdom that I mentioned before. And there's one um, in particular in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago that I feel sort of, I don't know, some kind of kinship with. Um, I um, sort of just think about how lonely it must be, um, sort of separated there in the museum. And so in my second year um, grad school at SAIC, I had been thinking a lot about this and then sort of began conflating the, um, that object, um, which is a portrait bust of a deceased king um, with my younger brother as somebody who I care like deeply about, um, but is uh, quite physically distant from me someone with whom I share a heritage, but whom, you know, they always say like, how much can you ever uh, truly know a person even as close as you are to them? And so that relationship um, between me and my brother and then the relationship between me and um, this altar head sort of get collapsed. Um, and that's how I, uh, and then looking at, his, again, the photograph that he himself took led me to this piece where I'm trying to sketch, um, sketch a vision not quite, um, that's both of, a specific person, um, but but also of the sort of mixed set of relationships, and so, and also of myself. Like I think you know, every portrait um, is also a self-portrait of the artist, you know, who makes it. So it's also myself how I see myself through my brother. Um, I guess I, the question. I guess what. Um, I also would like to know is why did you choose these phrases? Portrait of my brother is full American. Portrait of my brother is a miniature cow. Were these just randomly chosen or was there thought put into what you wanted to reflect your brother as? Because many people looking at it may, may wonder why as a miniature cow? Well, um... There's in the full set, in the full set of cards, in the full text game, there are about I think, 30, 30 phrases. And some of them come, uh, some of them are descriptions. So like Ice in a River, a Miniature Cow are descriptions of things that he's actually photographed. I see. Um, so they're from photos that, even though I didn't actually use these photos to create my other work, they're photos that I went through when I was um, sourcing images. Others um, describe um, a relationship or um, an interaction. Um, I think Katie mentioned a bit ago about not, like as a first generation American, not feeling Korean enough. Um, and I remember once Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, we I stumbled upon um, a group of like, I have an uncle who always gathered a group of African grad students to like make a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, home away from home kind of thing. And we came in and one of them said, I was like, oh, you know, like, Kufre, my brother, like, oh, he's full American. Um, so again, there are all of these different, um, through the set, there are all of these different um, facets, both of like, him through what he sees um, or this sort of again it's him but it's not not really literally him this idea of him through what he sees through what is said of him through what um could be these um different um different relationships that shape this um i guess first generation immigrant um position, or well, specifically first generation, like an Nigerian American uh, who 
lives in Vermont and stumbles through fields of miniature cows perspective. Got it. That's where the cows are from. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this actually allows me to pivot over to, um, to Katie because I feel like Richard has started this thing with language now because there's one piece and I'm gonna, sh the, this other piece that's in the show that's uh, Katie's piece where you actually, um, can you explain to folks what we're seeing here? And because of the lighting, because it's written, there's a lot of Korean characters that are written in this piece. Can you explain the relevance of this, Katie? Yeah. And well, the language here is relevant to you? Yes. Um, well, I'll just describe this piece first. It's um, two pieces of paper that I hand drew a grid on and I repeatedly wrote a phrase on there that's in Korean. Um, it's which means I lost it, um, which is a phrase I think that describes my relationship to the Korean language, which is uh, rocky, but we're, we're getting back on course. <laughs> um, I guess growing up in a Korean American household, um, you know, I have my parents speaking to me in Korean, but when I'm outside in the world, I'm always speaking English. And um, there got to a point where it's really hard for me to speak in Korean. It doesn't feel natural. Um, and I'm making up for that time now. So I, I made this piece as an acknowledgement of the relationship I have with the language. Um, yes, maybe my art right now is very Korean. It's exploring the side of me, but the reality is like, I'm struggling like it's hard I lost it and now I'm trying to find it again I don't sometimes it feels like I never had it so it's just that uncomfortable area of what is your native language you know so that is where this piece comes from I am continuing to make more pieces like this because it also serves as almost kind of just practice practice writing and practice reading and like actually learning Korean, when you go to Korean school, like any other school, when you have to learn spelling, you write it over and over again. So the title of this piece is Rote, um, R-O-T. Um, so I, I'm also kind of like, in this piece, it's like the relationship between the school teacher and the student, which is all within me, because I'm an adult now and it's my responsibility to choose if I wanna use this language or not, so. Yeah, and you know what's very interesting too, so much of language um, is contained, so much memory is contained in language um, in terms of how people remember certain things, maybe um, a song that was sung by a grandparent in a particular language. Um, and I just find it very interesting sort of the way things are sort of coming, cutting across um, all three of you in terms of, of language as, um, as something that's very common. Um, between you all. Um, I'm gonna go back over to Richard and see if you'd like to share another poem with us. All right. You have me starting to think about language now. All right, so this piece is called In Third World Shape. Uh, and the title is a play on uh, uh, bring it, a song from a band called Third World. Uh, and the hook says it's 96 degrees in the shade real hot. Um, and so when I was 13, my father sent me to the country um, to live with my mother for a little while. Uh, for the first time, so I was meeting her at 13. And I moved from sort of a middle class living to you know bathing outside with a pan and going up the hill to catch water um and it was a bit of a culture shock and it's also uh uh how how the people there you know how they say that place that time forgot it seemed to just be stuck in the past and so you would have these people just sitting on their verandas in the evening just looking over these cane these sugar cane fields um and so, so you talk about memory. So years later, I start writing and this image of that um, place just stuck uh, in that time led to this poem. And so um, it's called in third world shit. And there may be a couple of references in there that um, you might not get, but um, hopefully you can get the gist of it. Okay. 
everything is slow here. I feel is the heat. Slow like salt dissolving cannons on royal forts. Cannons now mockingly flawed in orientation. Slow like the languid jelly tree siphoning Portland loam. Painfully slow. Like when justice not coming. There is problem inherent in no problem. When estates merge to form island, you're always aware you're living on somebody's property. Descent understandably tempered by the involuntary muscle that is memory. Demands don't gush from thank you mouth. Everything is slow here. I still feel is the heat. But we, generation vex, intolerant of kerchief bosom vestiges, Refusing to celebrate meager servings of Cerasi pulp, we claim time. But maybe clock don't have second-hand memory like we. It's the Osnaberg box now reclined in boardroom chairs and chime progress. Live fissy bread fruit find countenance and witness reduced interest by commercial banks in the complexion of tellers. Clock just a go on, take it own time. And in the green stained oxygenated hills of Coca District on Magatis balcony, overlooking acres and acres of unsweet history, country people still sit for hours and verandas and stare. Just stare. Contentedly, unaffectedly, one hour behind New York. That was fabulous, Richard. I really enjoyed that. I love it every time I read it and when I hear you actually say it. And I wanted to follow up with a question to you, Rich, about um, the medium of poetry and how much you use memory to sort of, do you dip in a, me in a reservoir of memory to sort of, to create the work? Or are you always sort of working with sort of what the present is? Because what you just shared, a lot of it had to do with sort of looking backwards. Um, yeah, a lot of my writing is uh, linked to um, Jamaica's political and colonial history. Um, and then you, it's a melding of that with your own childhood and your current experiences. And, um, I don't, I'm the worst person to ask about the theory of my work um, because it, it was never created uh, to be seen like that or I never thought of it like that. And so I prefer to leave it for other people to look at it. And, um, you know, I'm the worst advocate for the work, is what I have to say. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Hope I answered it so far. No, no, you you did fine. You did fine. Um, did Uno or Katie wanted to ask any questions of Richard? I'm trying to sort of have other people. You all sort of chime in here. I, this isn't a question, but I just wanted to make a comment about that poem you just read, Richard. Um, I've never been to Jamaica, but I have been to Haiti and right. got a sense of just a Caribbean life. And it is slower there. Like, life is to, it moves slow and calm <laughs> when you're talking about you know people just out and staring it's funny right. that you, because of, like i I, fa I saw and i felt that it's very true like um yeah you use yeah. words i'm seeing i'm seeing it all it was really beautiful thank you okay but I don't want to monopolize the time. I'm sure there are other people here who want to ask questions, but I wanted to get through one more piece um, that was done by um, Katie. And if I can share my screen, I will show it to you. There are a couple pieces, a couple more pieces in the work that I wanted both artists to talk about before we go quickly to the Q&A. Just give me one second as I get to it. And this is about the 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 hanbok, which is the traditional uh, Korean um, piece that you've created, Katie. And I'm going to just share my screen so other folks can see that. And also about sort of, sort of memorializing the elements used 
at the dry cleaners that you use to work with, sort of the pins that, and let me go ahead. Can you tell us, first of all, what are these items made of and how they're relevant? Yeah, so the humble is constructed from um, dry cleaning tags that I have quilted together. And the strands are just, you know, me letting the machine run a little longer. And um, I made this because the humble is something that represents tradition for me. Um, I think about the humble as a form and I'm immediately drawn to like memories of my family gathering on New Year's on Solnal, like eating eating tteokguk, which is like this soup that we eat on New Year's Day, but then also brings memories of like discomfort and resentment. Um, so I, I love this form because it's something that brings joy, but then also confrontation. Um, I find that whenever I'm grappling in a space with such a high contract like that, there's growth that happens out of it. Um, so making this humbug was also a way of paying homage to you know my the generation before me and also elevating those materials to look like something beautiful and something grand. For folks to, who don't know what the the, the box um, what what the items in the box are made up of, if you could share. Okay, and then the box piece is a it's a canvas board with um, sewing pins that are hammered in there with a, a another dry cleaning tag. It's a special tag that means that that is on your clothes. That means you need to have it the next day. Um, so, and then I encased it in a archival box made of book cloth and book uh, book board, which is actually something that comes from my own life and labor. Um, I make books, I have done it for a while. So there's this merging of like, you know, the labor that allowed me to be raised here, but then there's also a relationship between what labor I am involved with that allows me to sustain myself. So this, this box was really, I think a lot of these things are just meditation for me. It's being able to feel closer to the materials that I've been around in my life and see them in a new way, but also meditate and sit with them and think about what it means and yeah. Yeah, very nice. I am, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, I believe. Let me go, I, I'm gonna just hop on here and just show, um, have Uno hop in. And this is another piece, installation piece that's in the show. If you could sort of, for folks who haven't seen the show, sort of talk about um, what prompted you to make this piece um, and why is it um, relevant to you and, and so forth. Yeah, so this piece is called a well, um, like, you know, like a well where you'd gather water. And um, it's 120 uh, pounds of black sand, which is a lot less sand than you'd think it should be. <laughs> you wanted um, more sand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the Smithson works a lot, a lot differently, but um with this glass bowl and I was thinking when I was going um again going through my brother's photographs and making the body of like mirrored photographic pieces I was thinking a lot about landscape um landscape and absence and something um as um, mentioned in my bio I'm really interested in this idea of the void of um, like lack and emptiness, um, the different ways it manifests, like sometimes through um, like lacks or gaps in the canon or um, sort of voids of meaning, void sentiment. And so with this piece, um, with really looking at Again, the idea of landscape and place and um, sort of pushing it further into a sense of like, again, in like a no place, a whole lot of nothing, um, 
sort of a wasteland or waste space. Um, again, that feeling of like loss and place, placelessness. Right. Thank you, Uno. I wanted to, I don't want to monopolize the time, but I have one last question um, and that's for Katie about the, the piece of work on the right is sort of what you did earlier. And the one in the show is the actual Hambach on the side. Is it pretty much safe to say that one is the extension of the other or? Definitely. Uh, the piece on the right is kind of my first exploration of using these materials. You know, normally before, for all of this type of work I was making was, I was mostly just drawing and making image-based works, like really graphic things. Um, so I got into this program at Hyde Park Art Center that kind of just gave me the push to make the work I've been wanting to make like forever um, and also guided me for how to go about it. So that first piece is, you know, the beginnings of my thought process and then the second piece to the left is more of like challenging myself to create a form out of something not just you know not just the fabric but like what comes next like the garment the sculpture and yeah okay thank you katie i'm gonna invite i don't want i want to have others be able to ask questions so if anybody uh in the audience would like to pose any questions to Richard, Katie, or Uno, feel free to do so now. And I wanted to also see if in the meantime, uh, Richard, if you could think of a poem, another poem that you would like to share, not now, but before we end the program today. Does anybody have any questions? I actually had a question for Uno. I wanted to, um, you talk about your brother several times. How, how is your brother figuring into your artwork? Um, like I said, I think I've been um, sort of at some point um, during grad school standing in museums sort of um, conflated this, the like um, distant artifact um, for which I felt some kind of like fraternal um, <laughs> feeling with my um, physically, though not emotionally distant brother. Um, and I find him like, it's just an interesting way to um, look, because why I'm interested in um, in, like in identity um, and in history, I don't really like making work about myself. <laughs> um, it seems too like, um, I don't know, maybe it's too revealing. So I'd rather make work about somebody who's similar to me, but not, <laughs> not the same. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, does anybody else have any questions for any for our panelists? I have a question or more of a comment um, for Katie. Um, so I very much, well, I wanna first of all say thank you to everybody. And it was really intriguing listening to everybody. And I'm glad I had my camera off because when Katie, when you were talking, I was like sobbing here because I'm also first generation um, Korean American. So a lot of the things, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna, um, so, so a lot of the things you were saying, I was like, oh my God, okay. And so I just wanna say um, how, how much I um, appreciate um, what you were saying. And it made me feel like I wasn't alone. And there are other people that, you know, that are in the same, have been in the same position as me. Cause I grew up in Chicago feeling like, okay, I have to be like everybody else. Being different is like, you can't do that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, does your, does your parents know that you're doing this work and what do they think about it? They do. They, I mean, my mom has to know by now because I'm in her shop being like, what can I take? Show me how to do this. Like, <laughs> um, my mom is proud. I think they're also kind of confused. They're like, 
okay like I asked the rest of my like aunts and uncles that have dry cleaners like hey can you collect your trash for me so that I can take it and make art out of it and so they're kind of like okay like as long as you don't need money like we love <laughs> it like we support this you're doing awesome you're never you're like not broke and you're like happy and doing something you're passionate about so you know I I think that like distance between the Korean and American between my family really shows itself when I am in an art context like the first show I ever had my mom was like she didn't know what to say she was just like oh yeah like Picasso and I was like thank you like <laughs> um but I, another thing I wanted to say is that the reason why I started making this type of, of work is also because I I long for a Korean American community you know I want more Korean people to be my friend and just you know especially if they're artists so like let's get connected and yeah just want to engage a little bit more with people that have similar backgrounds and just one one what just one more about yeah. language um so you mentioned that you're i'm um, starting to you know revisit visit or um, re-familiarize yourself with language. I'm also doing the same thing as well. And I, I wondered, have you been to Korea and do, does your family in Korea know that you're doing this work and how do you like navigate, how does that sit with you and how do you navigate that with your family in Korea versus like your family here? Um. Well, funny thing, I, before this whole pandemic thing, I actually booked a ticket to Korea to go to the, like for my first time. I was going to have like my eat, pray, love moment, but then, you know, pandemic. Um, still trying to figure out how to reschedule that. But I'm, the person that I think I'm closest with that's a uh, family in Korea is my oldest aunt. And she's actually, she's a creative, like she makes clothes. I am like just kind of learning about this. I think my family never saw it as like something that I'd be interested in because they were just like, oh yeah, she made clothes for us. She knows how to sew. Um, she doesn't know really about what I make. Um, every now and then my parents will like send pictures to her, but I think it's just like a, okay, she's doing her thing. You know, this is awesome. That's great. Uh, I think they're just happy to see me be excited about my family and my background. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Um, I have a question if no one else has one and that's for uh, Richard um, and then Uno. Um, and Richard, I was just curious to know if you could kind of tell us what is it that prompts you to write your poetry? Um, um, how do you navigate your, 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 your writing practice? Is it something you do when you're inspired, when the spirit moves you, or is it something that you sit down you know, every Thursday between four and seven to write, for instance? Um, well, I started writing, I used to work at an alumina plant. And if you can picture somebody who's artistic in an alumina plant, then you'll understand what my days were like. And so um, in order to escape that kind of mundane collecting samples, analyzing samples and so on. I started writing in my head. And so I have this argument uh, with a friend of mine where she says, if, I, if it's not on paper, then I haven't, I haven't it's not written. Uh, um, so she claims that I haven't been writing. Um, so all these years I've been writing in my head. Um, and it wasn't till years later that somebody said to me, you know, if you die, all those poems are gone, right? Um, and that's when I actually started actually putting them down. My process of writing is normally a line comes, add another line, add another line, and it's all done in my head. Um, and so for most of the years where I performed, um, I've always performed without reading, which is why reading is weird for me now, because I can't remember anything anymore. Um, so the process is you see life, you observe, and I, and I like to say that the art itself is in, if there's any art, I think it's in just the observance of life. Um, and to me, putting it down is the formality. Like I have a brother who I would say speaks in poetry, and I'm sure it would never cross his mind to uh, 
to get involved with the idea of poetry, but I think he's a poet. Um, and so, yeah, hope I didn't ramble on. No, 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 it was all very fruitful. Um, and I'll, I'll just see if anyone else has a question before I ask. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, oh there are two people there, Aisha, Aisha and David. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. Aisha. Okay. Um, my question is to all three artists, and the question is, what do each of the artists know about each other's histories, and how does that impact on the way that they view their own histories? Uh, should I go? Sure. Uh, so she's asking how we how much we know about each other's personal history or no. artistic history? No, your history in terms, in the context of the colonial, in terms of what you've been speaking about, in terms of memory and narrative, how much do you understand about the Korean history, the Nigerian history, and how does that impact on the strands that you draw on from your Jamaican history? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, uh, it's, it's everything. Um, it's everything. It's 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 this very idea of why is everything the way it is right now, and especially when you're, or when when you're, um, if you think of Jamaica, the whole idea of post-colonialism. It's the idea of every single thing. Like I, I said to my uh, my sister the last time we had a little Zoom meeting, and I said I was in in the UK and I was there for a reading, and I was looking at the ceiling of this cathedral. And it was in Bristol, which is one of those uh, points for the the uh, triangular slave trade. Um, and all I could think about, as magnificent as that roof was, was that it was built by sugar. It was the only thing I could think about. Um, and so history is 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 everything as far as um, as writing, um, as long as it's not like a personal piece, pieces or pieces about love or so on. I'd like to say that, you know, I don't know much about Richard and Uno's, you know, cultural history. Uh, I, I am familiar with colonialism and I'm also familiar with, you know, days in the past before westernization. And like, I think about memories of how my mom grew up and it's just a different world. It's almost like a dream. Like I can't even, it's so, but it's only one generation off. And it feels as though Richard and Uno are in some close proximity to that day that existed before westernization, before this, this landscape that was before time became really fast. There, there's a lot of trash. There's, it's, and you know, there's also the loss of identities that's happening in cultures and traditions. Yeah, I think for my part, in terms of um, history, I mean, I, I enjoy history and I enjoy trivia, so I spend a lot of time reading it. So I feel like I know um, maybe a bit more than average um, in terms of like Korean colonial history. Um, I don't actually, I'm not as familiar with um, Jamaica as I am with some other, like some of the other Caribbean islands like um, the Bahamas and Haiti. But um, for, the, I guess the relationship with um, Katie, I guess, who I know um, best out of our little panel. Um, I think, yeah, that shared, but she was saying the shared history of like being one, um, one generation off, but still really far. Um, the feeling of like losing uh, your language, but um, or like losing your homeland, but also like why, why isn't this also, like why isn't English in the US also your language and your homeland? Um, what were the forces um, that led that? And also actually in terms of colonial history, um, I think it's also interesting and important to remember that like the British to like 
global south relationship isn't the only colonial relationship like east asia has like an inter-asian colonial history that is often like overlooked in the u.s and whose um like repercussions of like still shape the world today and so i think a broader view of the colonial and post-colonial uh, is something that i think is important as well great question thank you for that Dr. Gillum, you have a question? You're muted. Dr. Gillum? Maybe we, let's try to, un, I'll ask to unmute. Uh, let me unmute him. Dr. Gillum? No. We still can't hear you. For some reason, I'm not able to unmute you. Can you maybe? There you go. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, all of you, Katie, Richard, and uh, Udo, for sharing a little bit of your personal history, family history, relationship with your art, because it really has enhanced my ability to appreciate your art. And uh, it, it reinforces the value of having a personal connection with the artist. Although the art maybe should speak for itself, I think when you're not as familiar with it, it can speak louder when the, audi when the artist uh, can give some commentary. So I thank you for all of that sharing. My question, and I appreciated all of this art, but my question is for Richard in terms of the poetry, especially those two that you read for us uh, mm -hmm. If you have ever thought about or even gone forward with creating any bilingual versions of your uh, poetry, and by bilingual, I mean specifically in a, a so-called standard English and the natural uh, patois, as you're calling it, Jamaican patois versus a standard, because I, I get the feeling I heard Jamaican patois and know some of it. I don't get the feeling I, since I can't speak it, that I can understand it all either. But I very much appreciate it and the tones and the accent of it. And most of us know it, especially through the music that has come out of Jamaica. But I'm wondering if uh, you see a need or have ever created like two page, two pages facing each other in a, any book of poetry with the two versions. I have some dogs going crazy outside. I, um... <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is live TV. Um, I would say, I was asked why I mix, like if you read my book, most of my poems are, they'll have one line pat for one line English or one line pat for the very end or um, and I was asked why I do it. And the reality is that I didn't think about it. I wrote it exactly the way I speak, which is I switch between both when I speak on a daily basis. So the only time I speak English on a daily basis is if somebody addresses me in English. Um, uh, and so I do write. Um, and there's also stigma um, with even, even the work itself um, is viewed a particular way if it is in Pato. Um, and so you lean a little more, and most people will lean a little more towards um, English. Uh, and when they do do it in Patois, they do it to like drums and call it dub poetry. But the, the idea is that um, I find that many people here do not. Um, I think once, for some reason, and this is just my personal opinion, once the work is supposed to be up here for some reason it's done in english there's also a class element too is there not mm -hmm. um so yes I, I don't know if i answered the question but that's the idea that um i have essentially been doing it uh in both uh, and i've also done music uh which is primarily in patwa okay Thank you. 
Can I ask a question? Sorry. Just to, just to branch off that, I'm just curious, let's say someone requested a translation of your um, poem, but like in Spanish, what, what would your approach be to that? I'm, I didn't hear, I, was Katie speaking? Yeah, the dogs outside are just yeah, like I, having a fit. Yeah. yeah, I didn't. I didn't get. Could you repeat, Katie? I was gonna say, let's say someone requested one of your poems to be translated, but you know, in a different language like Spanish. What would be your approach to that? Especially thinking about like the importance of phonetics in your in your work. Oh wow, I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> I have no. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, that would be very interesting to hear, though, uh, especially since part of our colonial history is um, is Spanish. Um, so it was Spanish and then British. So uh, that would be very interesting. Maybe the day will come. We'll leave it out there. <laughs> say, say again. Valerie, Val Valerie Smith apparently has a question. <laughs> Here we go now. <laughs> Hi, I really appreciated all of your work. It was brilliant. My question is for Richard, and I love Dr. Gilliam's question about bilingualism and writing a book in two languages. My question is, how important is it for you, Richard, to be understood? And I'm thinking specifically of Zora Neale Hurston writing in her African-American vernacular English and people having to approach that book, their eyes were watching God and they have to understand. So they come to it with that understanding. So is it the same for you that people need to come to the work and attempt to understand it on their own or is a glossary maybe in the second book being considered? What do you think? Uh, I think it's funny that you asked that because I, I performed, uh, I have a poem called Land where essentially I'm saying God made man from land and uh, man fought, got killed, got buried in land. So it's essentially recycling. And it's, it's the entire poem is in Patwa uh, and I did it overseas and I was worried that nobody would understand it. And uh, Two young ladies came to me afterwards and they said, we have a poetry reading, uh, monthly uh, poetry reading. We'd like you to come and perform, but you have to do that for us. Um, and I was very surprised because I thought I thought they would have no idea because that patwa is like the rawest patwa you can find. <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> but apparently they were able to sit through it to get the essence of what it was saying. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, so it is important to be on the, so after that experience, I, I didn't worry much um, about whether or not people get everything anymore, um, just for as long as they can get bits. Okay, I wanted to um, honor time here. We have five minutes left to go and Yolanda has, would like to ask a question. Hi, thank you. Um, and thank you all. This has been really great. Um, I'm a reluctant immigrant. I came uh, to the U.S. With, with a very firm native language of Spanish. And I'm interested in the idea that history can also be binding um, in, in the sense of freedom. I've always been fascinated by choices poets and writers make. For instance, you know, Diaz, who deliberately writes in English. And I actually go through the trouble of looking for Spanish translations of his English of the Dominican experience, for instance. Um, and I'm interested in, in how we access and compartmentalize different memories of our personal experience through language mm -hmm. when we have the, the, the privilege of two more than one language. Could you speak to that in your, um, um, Richard, I guess in particular about the relationship of, of freedom of using something like a colonial language such as like English to go even deeper into the experience of, of the colonized uh, ancestry. Does that make sense about I'm how we kind of switch back and forth languages depending not just on the emotion but also on our relationship with freedom and the idea of history's ties to freedom? 
Uh, I don't know about the ties to freedom, but I do know that there's a popular thing here that people say that you there are certain emotions that cannot be expressed in English. Um, and so if if you <laughs> I, I can't picture like the average Jamaican being angry um, as somebody who grew up with with um, Patwa as like their first tongue being being really angry and then expressing that anger in English. Um, <laughs> that would be very strange. Um, so, yeah, to me, there is a certain color that that, that tongue has. Um, and it's so natural. It's kind of like, um, I think the perfect example is I can do very uh, funny work in Patro, which I struggle with sometimes in doing it in an in a English point. So, like, my humor doesn't come across. Um, it's work. It becomes work when you have to do it. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense. Yes. I have, uh, I have uh, just some parting questions for all three people. And I'll start with Uno in terms of what do you think, what are you excited to work on next? And I'll ask the same question to both Katie and, and Richard, and then we can sort of close out. Well, I'm excited um, to I guess, plug for upcoming CAC productions, um, making work towards the survey show. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking also, actually, so I mean, continuing to work um, with text and with language, um, but also um, thinking of ways to, I think, broaden my practice more in the direction of a well, so more like material-based installation work, which is um, like, I guess, physically uh, fairly different from a lot of the other work I do. Um, so yeah, I'm just overall um, looking forward to uh, making, making more and um, exploring more in like the various media I work in. Also, another plug, next week um, on Tuesday on the Elastic Arts Twitch stream, I have a, um, an actual animated video piece, which is the first one of its kind that I've made that will be streaming. Um, so if you look on Elastic Arts website, they have information about that. OK, great. Thanks. I'll make a note of that. And Katie? Um, I am excited. What are you excited to do next? Like, what are you ready and raring to do? Um, well, I have, I'm excited to show the things that I have been um, working on throughout this pandemic. Um, I know we have another final show for the Hatch program, and I have another show coming up later on this year. So I'm excited that there are things set for me to actually show what I've been doing, which is, you know, expand. Uh, just expanding on this work already. And I'm also really excited to get to go to Korea when I can, um, when the world is ready. I'm really looking forward to how it's gonna impact my practice. Um, it's unfortunate that I wasn't able to go yet, but I trying to look at it in a way to restructure the trip to really get what I want out of it. I'm excited for you. Thanks. And Richard? What do you what do you what do you hope to work on next, or are you ready and raring to work on next in terms of your craft? Uh, I'm doing script writing right now, and I'll probably be writing something about that dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, pretty much script writing. Gotcha. And where can we find your poetry? Uh, the book is called uh, A Window to Let to Let the Light Out, and it's available on Amazon. Okay. Very good. Well, if there's no other questions, I will bring this event to a close. I want to talk, um, thank everyone who came from near and far to join us uh, this evening. Um, please look out for the works of both Uno, Kate, and Katie, and also Richard. Um, and thank you so much for joining us.